So I remember about 10 years ago, at the height of my early 20s progressivism, I had joined a student co-op. For those of you who aren't familiar with co-ops, they're basically a very hippie-ish notion that college students, or even grad students, get together and try to live together in an intentional community. It's a community where you experiment with radical equality and direct democracy, and really trying to live as sustainably as possible. And of course, almost everybody there was in contact with people who were local farmers, who were trying to do homesteading, who were trying to be sustainable agriculturalists. I, of course, was an engineer, and one of my good friends was somebody who was very interested in hydroponics, sustainable agriculture, and all the sort of hippy-dippy stuff that people have been talking about for a long time. How can we build a farm with the minimal amount of energy input, and having everything basically being self-contained? At any rate, this friend of mine, in addition to his participation in the co-op, had bought up a large amount of abandoned land in the Detroit suburbs. This was roughly around the time of the housing crisis, and land in the Detroit area was dirt cheap. And his idea was to reconvert this land, essentially to being farmland, to green up the urban areas. This was a concept that was popular back then and is still somewhat popular right now. At any rate, he had a large problem. This was summer, it was Michigan, it was incredibly humid, and his farm was covered with mosquitoes. You could hardly walk a step without getting bitten by three of them. You could just see them buzzing around the air. The whole place was just infested. And he, knowing that he had access to a lot of engineers, decided that the solution to this problem was, well, to invite predators, essentially build bat boxes or bat houses, so that bats and other predators that ate insects would move into the property and solve his mosquito problem. Simple enough engineering exercise. So me and a few other people who had an engineering background came over and tried to design design bat boxes for him. We took a look at the property, we took a look at his house, we tried to find the correct tree to put them in, and we looked at pictures of bat boxes and tried to build them. And of course, we tried them, the bats didn't come, the mosquito problem got even worse, it was even hard to imagine they were so thick in the air. And surprisingly enough, none of the other houses in the area had this problem. It was just, it was just located in this one house for some reason. But we said, okay, maybe the bat box is not built properly, let's go back to the drawing board. We looked at books, we looked at the migratory patterns of bats. We wondered how many mosquitoes would bats consume? What was the deal? How are we doing this? We tried again, but nothing seemed to work. And, you know, eventually people got frustrated. They left the project, so on and so forth. And I was one of the last people who was really interested in this project. And I, I came over to his house sometime towards the end of summer. And I remember talking to him outside his house saying something like, I'm really sorry that this whole bat box thing didn't work out for you. You know, I, I really thought this would solve your mosquito problem. And he's like, yeah, I know, but you know, summer is almost over. The mosquitoes are going to go away. And we're walking around the property, basically back behind the house, away from the area where we were trying to place the bat box, talking about this issue. And suddenly we turn around the shed and sort of get a new angle on the backyard. And I see in front of me a field of containers of water, just stretching out across the entire yard, which was probably about a quarter of a mile squared, just containers, kiddie pools, buckets, collecting still water, just lined up across the place. It was just scattered up all over the place. And, and I asked my friend, what are you doing? He's like, oh, well, this is a great system. I'm, I'm collecting rainwater, so I don't have to actually take water from the grid. You know, we're going to have this great system of water recycling. And I'm just, I'm speechless because I, I look at my friend and say, we spent two months trying to build a stupid bat box to get rid of your mosquito problem. And, and you've got a quarter mile square of still water. There's, there's obviously the reason why the mosquitoes are in your house is not because you have insufficient bats eating the mosquitoes. It's because you're, you have the largest collection of still water in a 10 mile radius. The mosquitoes are swarming in and breeding right there. I think I probably dropped some profanity before I finally left his property. But at any rate, I felt like a total heel because the issue was so obvious. And our solutions for it were so insane. You know, it's like that saying they have. Insanity is doing the same thing over again and expecting different results. And it was even more ridiculous because our solution was so complex. It was so Byzantine and had such a low probability of success that it was remarkable we had even thought about that before looking at the very obvious question of why the mosquitoes were there in the first place. And after that, I always told myself that insofar as my engineering career would go, I would always try to look for the simple solution, try to isolate 
like the main issue before I basically spun myself off on endless repeating loops of futile answers and futile solutions. And that fundamental engineering observation is just what I'm thinking again and again and again when I look at the current political environment as it surrounds all of these terrorist attacks. It's so repetitive. It's so redundant. It's so predictable. We know the entire pattern of the problem. We know the entire pattern of the proposed solutions to the problem. We can repeat them again and again and again. And this isn't just one side. Every single side of this, conservative, libertarian, progressive, they all have the most predictable answers imaginable, the most predictable reactions imaginable. It's the same thing over and over again. Now, of course, I'm not the first person to say this. You go on YouTube and almost everybody is saying this. The whole thing's predictable. We've had so many terrorist attacks. It feels routine. This is becoming something that we're almost used to. And much too much has already been said about how cliche the progressive reaction to these very predictable tragedies is. Pretty much everybody on the alt-right and on the libertarian and on the anti-SJW side has already gone over this. And sort of the persistence of their really facile replies to terrorism have been sort of a staple of conservative media. Nothing new. But one thing that I think has come in for far too little criticism is the anti-SJW and cultural libertarian reaction to these recent terrorist incidents. Because as much as they dress up their objections to the SJWs and progressive reply to these things, their own answers are just as banal and meaningless as anyone else's. Once you look at them for more than five minutes... The responses really fall into two camps, depending on whether you're on the more left-leaning anti-SJW cultural libertarian side, or on the more right-leaning anti-SJW cultural libertarian side. The two replies usually go either, Islam is bad, and we got to find the moderates on the left, and Islam is bad, and we have to condemn it across the board on the right. But of course, both of these are idiotic responses to the terrorism that we're seeing right now. Even if they're true, they offer no insight into what's going on right now, how it's being allowed to go on right now, and what are the potential ways to actually confront it. So let's start with the Islam is bad. We got to find the moderates to bring them to the true faith of liberalism. I hear this from a number of the more left-leaning cultural libertarians like Kraut and T, like Fox from the West, like Spinosaurus can to a certain degree. And indeed, it looks like it's a perfectly rational response to something like this. But guys, we've been trying to do this for 15 years now. I mean, I feel like an old fart bringing this problem up, but I mean, are people old enough to remember the fact that we've been trying to do this for 15 years? Ever since September 11th, we've been trying to look for the moderate Muslims that will convert the entire Islamic world to see the true faith of liberal democracy and ma freedom. But with all the funding from the State Department, the Pentagon, and the various resources of NATO and the European Union, no such solution has been found that is remotely satisfactory. And and that's with all of the resources of the West behind them, progressive, conservative alike. And what has 15 years of this yielded in terms of actual political results? Is there a moderate Islamic community? Is there a moderate Islamic country that's emerged in the last decade that can really lead the way to show how you can integrate true Islam with true liberal democracy? There really isn't. In fact, it's the exact opposite. The best examples we have, well, specifically Turkey, seems to be going backwards to a more Islamized model of government. And even in the West, can you point to a really good, moderate Muslim critic of radical Islam? Because I'll tell you the problem. All of the candidates for this really, really good, moderate Muslim thinker fall into two camps that render their presence on the political scene utterly useless. So the first camp is what I call the apostate Muslims. These are people like Irshad Manchi, like Ayan Hirsi Ali. These are the people who have deep criticisms of the state that Islam is currently in. They want to see the West survive, but they have absolutely no clout within the Muslim community writ large. All they are is talking to a Western audience to help a Western audience understand the problems, but they can't be part of the solution. And on the other side of this divide, you have what I call the moderate PR manager Muslims. These are people like Linda Sarsour, Tariq Ramadan, and these people indeed do have some clout inside the Muslim world, but I'll let you in on a little secret. 
They have no interest in saving Western civilization at all. These people care about liberalism and democracy only insofar as it actually increases the political clout of Muslims as a demographic and political group inside the West. They're interested in maintaining immigration rates, in understanding how these people can be integrated insofar as the European community modulates its own behavior to accommodate the norms of Islam, and never vice versa. Linda Sassora and Trik Ramadan might make conciliatory sounds in the direction of liberalism and democracy, but this is only in light of the fact that they know that the debate is going to be taking place again in 30 years, this time with a much, much, much larger Muslim percentage of the population. As such, every one of their statements is modulated to really concede as little as possible on the Islamic side and to put Western institutions on trial for their inability to incorporate increased amounts of Muslim immigration into the West, something that will be fatal to any attempt to actually liberalize Islam if there are serious structural flaws to the culture. And you know what? At the end of the day, I think people like Fox from the West and Kraut and T even realize this. They probably would admit to this if I asked them it directly in a live stream. But here's the point, guys. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to find moderate Muslims harder in the next decade? Did all the combined resources of the State Department and NATO just not have the oomph to get to the true moderate Muslims that would be the missing link between liberalism and Islam? The thing is, is there appears to be a chasm between the two ideologies of the Western post-Enlightenment concept of government and Islam in any meaningful expression. And as such, any moderate is inevitably on one side of this abyss or the other, and cannot themselves be a bridge, and so the project is futile. And again, I don't think it took us 10 years or 15 years to figure this thing out. And of course, when I say this, I can immediately hear cheers from the more right-wing side of the anti-HW cultural libertarian sphere of YouTube. People like Sargon of Akkad, people like Noel Plum, people like Computing Forever. Because to them, the solution isn't, we're the moderate Muslims. To them, the solution is, just call Islam uniformly bad. Go onto the air and just condemn the religion in perhaps some kind of Christopher Hitchens tone of indignation. Oh, Islam, it's so terrible, it's deplorable, it's unliberal. I agree, that's cathartic. But what has that accomplished? You're not going to say anything that Christopher Hitchens didn't say in 2007. You're not going to elucidate anything that wasn't common knowledge to anybody who had ever cracked a history book outside of the purview of the Ultra Progressive Academy. Because despite of all of the numerous new conservative voices from 2002 to the present day going, Her dur, Islam bad, Islam bad, Islam bad, Islam bad, the West has done absolutely nothing to confront this problem. And moreover, the leaders in charge of the EU and the United States have done nothing to actively defend the West against increased immigration waves from these countries. I mean, once you actually get past the whole Islam bad, Muhammad was a pedophile type criticisms, at the end of the day, what do you have? What are the actual solutions these people are proposing? Well, it's deportation, forcible re-education, loyalty oaths, these are the type of solutions I hear, and every single one of them violates this golden cow of liberalism that is ostensibly the only objection to Islam to begin with. So I'm wondering, where's the ground to even stand on to make this criticism? This has become such an obvious cliche, and it, and it leads into so few fertile directions for actually exploring the source of this problem. I don't know where to begin, because regardless of what anybody says about Islam, regardless of what anyone says about the terrorist tax and how the government's dividing up its resources or allocating its time in watching people, there's one central question that we are not asking. How did our current problem happen, and why is nobody actually confronting it inside our government and academy? Because if the problem is Islam, then why is it happening now? I mean, Islam's been around for 1,300 years, and it's never had this kind of interaction with the West. Islam's been trying to violently seize Europe for about 900 years now, and it's never gotten closer than it has in the last two decades. And of course, our scholars have all the advantages of hundreds of years of history, detailing everything about past caliphates, about Tamerlane, about Muhammad. Why is this happening now? Why is this happening to us? Why isn't this happening to Israel or China? Because for all the goings-on about how Islam is evil, I'll tell you one thing Islam is not. Islam is not unique. 
Islam looks like any other run-of-the-mill pre-Christian religion derived from a desert vagabond. When I look at the Islamic source material, all I think is unremarkable. And when I look at Islamic history, all I think is predictable. There will always be aggressive cultural forces like Islam in the world, set on taking over and exploiting countries that leave themselves open to that. There will always be faiths focused on conversion, even conversion by the sword. And Islam is just one instance of that central problem. The only thing remarkable, the only pertinent question anybody should be asking and answering is why are we allowing this to happen? Why are our leaders, why are our intellectuals inviting this in a way that would never have occurred at any previous time or in any other civilization the world over? That's the only question that's not going to result in the same endless repetition of the same bromides, either from the progressives or the anti-progressives or the anti hws or the cultural liberties libertarians again and again and again. Because the problem isn't that we don't have enough bats eating the mosquitoes. The problem isn't that our bat box is designed poorly or that we haven't really considered where we've put it. The problem isn't that we just got unlucky and suddenly we're hit with this infestation of mosquitoes. The problem is, is that we've manufactured a swamp inside our own culture over the last 50 years. We have no right to expect different results. We have no right to expect any different outcome that was occurring right now that we see every day in the news. Because the problem isn't Islam. The problem isn't even that we don't have enough brave cultural libertarians to sally forth and wave their finger at all the naughty Islamists in the West today. The problem is us. The problem is that we've meticulously created a cultural environment that could result in nothing but another aggressive culture coming in and asserting its will over us. We've created the environment where these attacks are expected and inevitable, and it's time to drain the swamp.